Welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show, we have a look at the new bikes from Prime. That's their downhill bike and their enduro bike. Absolutely gorgeous looking bikes, those. Uh, we check out some tools from Park Tool and also from Nipex, the pliers brand. Plus, we have an interesting look at some smart inner tubes. Okay, so let's dive into the topic of this week's show, and it's all about carbon and alloy as well, manufacturing materials to make bikes and wheels and things like that with. Now, I got to this because uh, someone else actually behind the scenes at GMBM picked up on something I said last week, where we teased some images of what appeared to be a Mondraker Summon Carbon, uh, a bike that they didn't suggest was coming down the line. Um, I mean, come on, we all know what they're playing at. They launched the Alloy one, they tell everyone that the Alloy is the better bike, that the riders love the Alloy one. You know, they're just kind of queuing everyone up for a lighter, faster, better carbon one, surely. And the same goes for Trek. Yeah, we've got this Alloy one, blah, 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 you know, high pivot, works amazingly. Who are they kidding? There's gonna be a carbon one. Look at the bikes at Trek, mate. They're not gonna suddenly ditch OCLV technology. Um, you know, it's what makes the world go round, is this sort of stuff. However, you can't knock the fact that Alloy bikes are incredible value and most of us, well, probably, um, I'd, I'd imagine most percentage of all of us out here will have Arrow bikes. I say this completely ashamedly, the fact that I don't have an Arrow bike currently. And in fact, I do, I have one, I have a hardtail, uh, but most of my bikes are made essentially of posh plastic, uh, which is a very nice material. But let's have a little look about the things that are good and bad. Um, on, I'm gonna use wheels and frames as an example. So with carbon frames, Undoubtedly, they look beautiful, yep. Um, it's kind of easy to make that sculpted look because of the way they're molded, rather than made from tubes or uh, semi-monocoques or you know hydroformed or things like that, like you do with, with alloy. Um, and because of that, you can chop weight off the bikes fairly easily. You can add strength in places by using, being very clever with the way things are, lay, are layered up uh, in terms of the direction of the weave of carbon. The frame feel, like I say, can, you can change this thing. It's easier also for manufacturers to put pivots and things in bizarre places that would otherwise take a lot of strange bits of metal in order to get a pivot in a particular place. Uh, so the frames can look very clean, smooth, sculpted, and high-end looking. Uh, now, of course, the downsides are carbon frames can be eye-wateringly expensive. Uh, we all know that. Now, I'm not suggesting at any point here that a carbon is better than, than alloy. Um, I don't see much of a difference now that the manufacturing techniques in alloy have improved so much. And now we're starting to settle a bit more on bike design. I think alloy is fantastic as a metal. Um, but what do you think of it? Of course, don't you know? Don't necessarily need to bring the pricing in. I'm talking about the benefits of the metal. Yeah, they both break, so you can't just say, "Oh, you have an expensive car and bike and it breaks." Anything will break. Okay, so there's not really a concern with that. Carbon bikes. Yep, you could have a crack in the carbon. You could snap a head tube off. Exactly the same with alloy. Alloy bikes, you tend to get catastrophic failure of the material as well. So um, I don't see anything with with those that makes a difference. Wheels, though. I see radical differences between the two. Now I've ridden loads of different sets of carbon wheels and alloy wheels. Now the thing I noticed with carbon wheels to start with was people were getting rather excessive of making a stiff wheel. If you have anything too stiff on a bike, you just can't hold onto the thing. Uh, you need elements of flex and compliance to propel yourself forwards, to have traction, to have good feel and that. And if a rim is too stiff, it feels awful. Fact, it can't possibly feel good which is why you're starting to see manufacturers now, uh, Crank Brothers, for example, and also uh, Zip with their three moto wheels. They're having a stiffer rear wheel where you need that strength because of the way that you ride a bike on the back there. Uh, and the front wheel has more compliance and lighter weight. So it's more forgiving and gives you the traction and another benefit. So people are understanding that. But they're super, super expensive. Alloy wheels, for example, you can have much cheaper wheels and you're not gonna cry if you ding a rim or if you crack a rim or whatever. So really, I'd actually favor alloy wheels in all cases except for one, the cross-country wheel. Now, bearing in mind that I'm fairly tall and I'm fairly heavy, I still like my cross-country bike to ride like a cross-country bike. I don't want it to be like a heavy-duty trail bike, so I'll always want the lightweight wheel. And the only way to get the good ride quality and not have a wheel that buckles and crumbles under me is by having carbon, actually. Uh, it's taken me a long time to really sort of get to the point where I really like the weight of my cross-country bike. I like the support that a wider rim gives me. The only way to do that is with carbon. So I'd quite happily run nice, cheap budget wheels on everything. Cross-country bike is the only one I really get a benefit from carbon, though. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Uh, and it's interesting, you're looking at EWS Pros, for example. 
they will use, a lot of them will use alloy wheels over carbon, despite what their sponsor may make, because of the fact that if they crack, quite a, crack a carbon rim in a race run, for example, that's fine, but if it starts leaking or whatever, uh, leaking air from it, they're not gonna be able to finish their run. Alloy ones tend to kind of hold onto the tire okay. You can sort of bend them back into shape a bit, at least enough to finish the stage before it fails completely. So there's a good reason for them to be running those. But um, yeah, I'd love to know what you think on carbon versus alloy. So don't let this be about the price. And really this is more about the material, how it feels. Is it too stiff? Does it look disgusting? Like all of those sorts of things. Love to know what you think. And uh, a little bit about the sustainability about it as well because let's face it, that is a hot topic around the world for everything at the moment. We know that alloy frames can technically be melted down and used again or repurposed for other stuff, and some carbon manufacturing can be, but not at all. Um, if you look at the moment, for example, Gorilla Gravity, they've got their revved carbon, which they can repurpose. So if you crack one of their frames, they'll take the frame back off you and they'll sort of um, do their equivalent of melting down the frame and reusing. Uh, but of course, that's not always possible, but um, interesting food for thought. And what would you prefer to have as well? Would you have a carbon bike or an alloy bike, uh, regardless of price, if someone was gonna buy you a bike tomorrow, what would you have and why? Same goes for wheels. Okay, so let's dive into news. And wow, we've got packed news this week. So first up, I wanna talk about Prime Bicycles. Uh, there's a few images popping up on screen of what, if you agree with me, are some of the best looking bikes we've seen for quite some time. Now, looking at those bikes, they might start looking a little bit familiar to you. Some of the sort of design attributes on them, uh, the seat mast on them, and of course the linkage design on there, and that lovely front triangle look. It's because they're basically they're designed in conjunction with Ciro Design. So Ciro are based in Barcelona. They've also designed things like the Intense Bikes and of course Uno, which you might recognize some of the design traits from. They're exceptionally well designed and they really have thought of everything on these bikes. So of course there's the Enduro Bike and there is the Downhill Art, both of which have none adjustable geometry. So they are saying they have found the perfect geometry for the application and that's what you get. Right, so let's have a little look at the two bikes. So the first up, we're gonna have a look at the Thunder Flash, which is the Enduro bike. So hopefully there's loads of stunning images whizzing past on screen now. So in prototype stage, they tested 80 different configurations of geometry. 80, like that's quite nuts, isn't it? And they basically came back to a single offering, which they just found universally across their testing program is the best. Though they've not even included on this like flip chips for adjusting things like BB height and stuff. So they are dedicated to this. So it's 29 inch wheels, it's running 170 travel up front, 165 on the rear. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty aggressive looking bike. So it's a short link four bar style system. It's got three frame sizes, medium large and extra large with a reach of 460, 480 and 505. So bang on the money there. Uh, 64 degree head angle, which Sounds really slack, but actually it's starting to become the norm. There's a lot of bikes out there using that head angle these days, which is great. It seems to work for that application. All good. Seat angle is size specific, so we are hovering around 78 degrees, or at least 78 on the extra large and down to 77.8 and 77.6. That's all to achieve the right dynamics on the frame. Just a teeny bit different there. Now they've got Enduro Max bearings. Uh, they're the best rated bearings from Enduro bearings. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that they have four bearings on the drive side of the main pivot and they have two on the non-drive side because there's so much more power and torque and just everything pushed into that side of the bike. It makes sense to do this. Uh, that's actually the same on the downhill bike as well. So these things are incredibly durable. They're really, really well beat. Uh, <laughs> really well designed to take a beating, is what I was going to say, or a beasting. Uh, so there's water bottle mounts on here, so happy for all those water bottle lovers out there. Threaded BB, uh, really nice detailing, so it's got built-in chainstay protector. There's like a rear fender to help protect the shock and sort of uh, the bearings and stuff from flying crap. There's a uh, head tube protector there made out of rubber, you know, down tube protection, all that sort of stuff, but it's all like seamlessly uh, put into the frames part of the design. But the Rocket, I think this is even better. So this is a downhill bike, and I've said before, I think downhill bikes are probably the coolest looking of all mountain bikes and this one has got to be up there. So, back to down about the same concept. Uh, they did prototyping in alloy mules and they're offering a single geometry on the frame. Of course, with a downhill bike, you can fine tune out with the height of the twin crowns on the uh, on the fork stanchion tubes there. So it's got that seat mask design. The crash replacement policy, like I said, on the, on the seat post is five years on the frame, lifetime. Brilliant, and I think that's the same on both frames actually. So 29 inch wheels, they're committed to that. 200 mil travel up front, 195 out the back, uh, medium, large, and extra large frame options. 
Reach is interesting, so 455, 475 at 500. 500 on a downer bike. Man, that is a big bike. That's a downer bike that would fit me. Amazing. I think that's really good to see. Uh, 450 chain stays on there, so real good length for speed and stability, uh, but not too long. That's probably about bang on for those size wheels. 63 and a half degree head angle, so slightly slacker uh, than the trail bike, of course, there. But bearing in mind, you can obviously, you could steepen that marginally and you could slacken it marginally, depending on your frame size configuration and what sort of upper crown you run on the forks there. Prime say the Rocket is a downhill masterpiece. Do you know what? I'd be, be inclined to kind of agree with that, but uh, I do like the fact it's got a single bit of geometry and it's just like, get on the thing, go and win a race but also that might bother some of you. Do you reckon that this bike is a downhill masterpiece? Let us know what you think in the comments underneath. Okay, next up, there's a few new tools from Park. I mean, I, who am I kidding? I love Park tools, I love all this stuff, so I'm clearly gonna talk about these rather than just hang them straight on the wall. Uh, first up is the DAG3, that's a derailleur alignment gauge. Uh, now, these have been around for a long time, so I think this is the third iteration, maybe more than that. Um, I've still got an ancient one. I've got, got to confess, I don't use it that much because the fact that most of the bikes I work on, they don't need things straightening because they're relatively new. However, all bike shop mechanics will know these style tools very well, and you're probably, as Finn from Full Factory Suspension pointed out with his ancient one of these, it's not that compatible with modern frames that have got much beefier dropout areas, so you couldn't actually get the tool in. Um, so in which case, that is the latest version. So that is really gonna be compatible with far more frames. Uh, next, Handlebar Holder 3. Now I've got the really old one of these and I still use it all the time, but it is a little bit of a problem because I guess it wasn't really designed around mountain bikes in the first place. So it was quite lightweight, it's just a prong that sits over the handlebar, it's got a little Velcro strap that goes under your down tube. Brilliant if you've got like, um, you're working on the front brake or something, you don't want the bars to move around. But of course, with much heavier mountain bikes, it's just not that good, if I'm completely honest. This one though, adjustable, and it's got like a rubber strap for the bars or seat post, wherever you want to put it on, uh, and the other end of the frame. Just a really good, simple bit of kit. Uh, what else have they got? Oh, these are nice. So I don't even know the name of this one. Uh, this is the QTH1. Anyone out there use the Y handle, just the generic wrenches, I pretty much live on those. Uh, there's always a couple in the car boot as well, in my little tool holder, great things. But I really like that little ratchet tool from Topeak. And although this isn't a ratchet, it's got a bit holder with a little, okay, it's can't come out. Gotta love that. <laughs> and the last one is the suspension bearing kit. So this will be, I think people are probably asking for this one for quite some time. It's essentially a mini headset press style tool. Looks exactly the same, the same form as their popular headset press. And it's got all the bits under the sun in here. Uh, very helpfully, it says so. This one's a 22.3 outside diameter. It's got all the markings on for virtually every fitting. Of course, if your frame has a, a big external part that gets in the way of getting access to the bearing, you might need a slide hammer or something to remove the bearings, but this will do like most frame sets. So uh, again, not really a home sort of thing. This is for the pro mechanics out there, but if you like to change the bearings on your bike, you will need something like that. Okay, next up is a few tools from Nipex. So let me tell you a little bit about Nipex. They're known as the pliers company. Now for a long time, I've talked about a pair of these. I have at home, I've got the 250 mil, which is the biggest size that goes up to 46 millimeter. Uh, this one is a 180, it goes up to 40 millimeter. But I do a whole series of these things. Uh, these little locking pliers, that's what they're really famous for. That is their iconic tool. You'll pretty much see a set of these in either the smaller size, middle size, or the bigger size in most World Cup mechanics uh, kits because of the fact they're replaced, having to have a whole set of spanners, adjustable spanners that are never quite as good as a locking set. And the, even the bigger size that I use are even good enough to use on fork top caps. But at last, I mean, I'm gonna have this one because it's the 1T5, the tiny one. So that's gonna replace all my annoying little small spanners. And really, that is the one for me. Tiny, great little thing. But I also do these, which is the world's smallest water pump um, pliers. And look at that little thing. That is insane. Look at the size of it. It's absolutely teeny. That would actually make a pretty good companion to go in your trail toolkit on your bike. It wouldn't get that much use, but the fact it can really, really lock on, really quite aggressive, but you have to see this up close to appreciate the machining. Hopefully my shots on screen will show you just, just how nice that is to look at. I mean, this isn't just like a pressed bit of steel. This is a proper nicely machined bit of kit. Absolute teeny. Yeah, that could definitely live in a riding pack. Also, something very close to me is a uh, pipe cutter. Now, a lot of people frown about pipe cutters on bikes, but I've been using these for years. And the biggest concern tends to be either using a 
blunt blade on them or over tightening them. Um, as long as you use a fresh blade and you don't over tighten, you just whiz them around nicely, you can get a really, really good, clean and fast cut. Again, if you're traveling on the road, something like that's gonna be much more suitable than having to have a saw, a saw guide, and of course a vise to use that with. So that's really the portable option. But I love the fact that unlike my version of these, which is a Syntex one, um, where you have to twist the handle forever to get it engaged, you can engage it with uh, like their own clutch system on here. Cool stuff, and it's got the little deburring tool that you whiz around on the inside of your steerer tube or whatever it is you've trimmed down, uh, just to make sure it's a nice smooth cut. Okay, so the next thing in use, Feels a bit of a contradiction to me, a smart inner tube. Yeah, I think one or two of you might know my feelings on using inner tubes, I'm not the biggest fan. I think I, an inner tube I consider as a spare part for me uh, to get me off the trail if I manage to destroy a tire. However, I know that's not the case for so many people. And without a doubt, these are probably some of the most advanced inner tubes ever. So these by Tubalito, they're made from uh, TPU. So. The cool thing about these is they are extremely light. And the lightest ones, in fact, that I do carry as a spare for that eventuality when I do destroy a tire, they are absolutely tiny. So if you're an enduro racer, perhaps, or any kind of racer, and you want to tape one on your bike, a little bit of tape would just go under your saddle rails. You wouldn't even know it's there. And it's a spare part that stays on your bike. It doesn't weigh anything. Uh, so for these ones, you're talking between 90 and 93 grams, and they weigh a little bit more, probably five or six grams more than their regular lightweight tubes. And that's because it has the addition of an NFC chip in there. So it's a near field communication chip of which you can actually read the tire pressure using your phone or device just by hovering it near the tire. Don't have to get a pump out, don't have to get a tire gauge out and put it onto, onto the actual valve at all. If you're using a set of inner with these in, you can literally do and it reads up just like you see on screen, reads up tire pressure. That's quite a cool concept and a real cool use of that NFC chip. So the NFC chip, in case you're wondering, is effectively like a SIM card. It's a battery-free chip and you can upload data to it and read data from it in a near-field way. So you need the app on your device, so in this case the Tubalito app to go along with this, and you can read your tire pressure. So that, I'm sure for some people, will be super helpful. I think it's a really cool piece of kit. And actually, I'd quite like that feature to be inside tires. So I think that'd be really handy. Uh, it's one less thing to carry on a trail. I do like to carry a tire gauge, uh, but that's just me being finicky. Do you check your tire pressures? Do you check them when you're out riding ever? Um, I sometimes like, quite often do that. So that technology for me is actually quite interesting. Uh, cool stuff. And as far as inner tubes go, yeah, that's pretty wild. So they retail for $49 each. So it's um, fairly steep as far as inner tubes go. Uh, but it's cool stuff, cool tech nonetheless. Okay, so before I jump into comments, I just want to address something that I messed up last week. I called that new Float X shock by Fox a DPX, uh, DPX2, because of the fact I literally, before filming, I had a couple of shocks. This is a really old Float X, I think from probably 2015, maybe 2014, or something like that. And that's a DPX2 from 2018. Um, yeah, and basically I, was, I got the X's messed up. So yes, the Float X is a brand new shock based on the concept of what the original one did. A little bit different to the DPX2, which uh, seems to be uh, on the way out. But uh, the Float X, in case you wondered, this is it on screen. The latest shock from Fox. It looks excellent. Right, now let's move on to comments. Um, so bikes getting long, we talked about that in the show last week. It tends to be totally mixed views, actually. I was looking through this and I couldn't find any sort of comments that I really wanted to discuss, but there was a very mixed consensus. I know there's a few of you talked about my reference to the EWS point, but saying that some people are actually preferring to pick short bikes or the mullet setup. Yeah, absolutely so. Um, what I was referring to is, you know, the overall sort of layout and geometry of a bike in order to uh, preserve your energy on the end of a longer bike. We definitely do that more than a shorter bike. Um, but yeah, interesting stuff. But um, it certainly seems that bike manufacturers going the right way, but length isn't the all out selling point for a lot of you. So interesting stuff there. Okay, so uh, Nick Blundell says, toolbox down a flight of stairs, the best orange bike sound reference I heard in a long time. Thanks for the lols. <laughs> okay, so right, by the way, this is not a dig at orange because I've ridden many myself that have been fine. It just so happens that I know quite a few people have got orange bikes that do sound exactly like that because they don't look after them. They've got a chain slap on them. They've got the old box section like Patriot style chain 
chainstays, uh, well, it's kind of like swing on rather than a chainstay. They are lovely bikes, but you, uh, you know, they're going to amplify the sound because of the design. So, uh, you know, if you make them silent, they are completely silent and they're great. But um, I, st I still love that analogy as well, actually, because uh, you must have seen Home Alone where the uh, toolbox literally goes down a flight of stairs and wipes out Joe Pesci and the dude with a bigger nose than me. But uh, yeah, pretty good. Uh, next up's from Mr. Grey Fox Zero. I'd be interested in the topic on one of the coming shows on ideas and solutions for bike storage. Yeah, 100% we can do that. I think actually maybe we should incorporate that as part of a, a bike cave thing because I know a friend actually is just doing out his workshop and he's looking at different types of hooks and I think he's gone for something like, uh, I've got regular just cheap hooks on the wall in my workshop but um, I don't move the bikes around. He's got even more limited space and he wants to get the bikes closer together so he's got, I think they're toe peak hooks that actually can move side to side which is a really cool way of doing things. So yeah, there's definitely some good storage ideas and in fact if anyone preempting that has got some cool ideas for things they found maybe at DIY stores or you know online or whatever or you've seen in other people's videos um, that are useful to share the information let us know uh, could it could actually be quite a cool video actually you know just a general storage for bike stuff next up is from Bert hey Bert Colin Furs has just made a hydraulic cylinder bike that's got changing geometry that you could easily test uh, crazy slack have angles and extended reach. Silly and great stuff. Yeah, I've seen that. So it's basically a bike that appears to be entirely made of hydraulic rams uh, and he has to carry a gas cylinder around to power them. Uh, yeah, absolutely insane. That guy, love to meet him. Uh, he's just another level of bonkers. You know, he's actually used to be a really good BMX flatlander. Uh, you might notice he's always wearing like Eccles and stuff like that in his videos. I think he's still a bit of a secret BMX under there. Uh, I think it'd be really cool to sort of hook up with him. Uh, he's obviously got a fair few followers. I wouldn't be doing it for uh, anything like that. I'd just love to meet the guy because I think it's fascinating what he gets up to. What a nutter. I'd love to see that zombie apocalypse bunker he's got in his garden. That would probably be the coolest bike cave of all time uh, if, if he was really into his bikes. Uh, next up says uh, they do, but it's nice to have options to cover all those preferences. And about brands that are good on building road bikes and mountain bikes, I would give Orbea as an example, but for some reason you don't speak too much about them. Why? No idea. Um, I did do a video for Shimano uh, a couple of years ago. I did XTR Modern versus Old, I think it was an anniversary for, for them, and I borrowed that old Trek from Jamie Lynn over at Mountain Mania Bikes, uh, and I used an Orbea as the bike in the video. And actually, to be fair, I loved it. I couldn't believe how light it was. Uh, I think it was a Rayon, or Rayon, I forget how you pronounce it, uh, that I rode at the time. It was a little bit short for me, but I think that they've changed geometry in a lot of their bikes. I know uh, one of the guys behind the scene, one of our guys, Jack, he's got one of their Occam's, and that's a really nice looking bike. It's flipping light. Um, so no reason, just haven't talked about them. So there's no conspiracy there. Um, maybe I'll be riding one soon. Uh, Mr. Grey Fox Zero. Honestly, Doddy, what's going on with the bike cave? Do you plan to quit this section of the show because it's my favorite, or are you missing stuff? Uh, so I'd ask you to tell me and help me with the uploader because it never worked on me. Uh, well, firstly, uh, what's happened with the uploaded? Be, can you be a bit more specific? One of our guys uh, checks, I mean, I do check the comments, but we also got a team of people behind the scenes. Uh, if you let us know in those comments what's not worked, uh, be specific, like at what stage of the uploader, um, and they'll get, get someone to fix it, basically, because it should, should work. Uh, and yeah, we do still do Bike Cave. In fact, there's Bike Cave coming up in this show. Uh, just chopping things around a little bit. If you hadn't noticed, I talk quite a lot. So the show's a half an hour long. If I feature every section that we normally feature on the show, it could normally go on for an hour. Like, that's too long for a YouTube video. And in fact, I keep getting told off for making the videos half an hour long. So just trying to keep it fresh. And actually, on that front, you, maybe you guys can actually help me out with that. So, in the show, we have the topic, we have comments, we've got news, and of course, we've got our regular bits of content, which are Bike Cave, Rewind, and Top Mods. Um, it's getting harder and harder to feature all three of them per show. Would you like me to alternate them? Would you like me to have a spinny wheel and we pick which one's gonna go in each show? So I, you know, I have to prepare all three and then we just literally pick one and go with it. Let us know, it's your show. I'm making this show for, for your enjoyment, it's only my enjoyment as well, because uh, that's what I like doing, but um, I want you to enjoy the show. So if there's things that you think I should be doing more, please let us know. Uh, we, love, we love hearing what you have to say. Um, so yeah, there you go. Let us know what you think of the GMBN Tech Show. Let us know what you think we should change, um, if anything, or swap around, or maybe shorten and other things maybe lengthen. Honestly, go for it. Um, be nice though. <laughs> Now on last week's show, I said I was going to talk a bit about Rolling Dale Cycles, and when I uploaded all my rushes uh, after filming, unfortunately that clip was corrupt. So I'm just going to throw it back in again, right now. 
Here we go. Okay, next up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Rollingdale cycles. Uh, because I've been following them for a while on Instagram, I think I've thrown them up on a show a few times. Uh, in fact, here's their Instagram page right now. And it was because they make a beautiful titanium hammer. So I followed them because essentially Toolbox Wars and I got in a chat on, on Instagram. They're like, you need, you need to have a look at uh, what Dale is doing. So I did and I got in touch with him and it sounds like such a cool guy. So here is Dale on screen and um, forgive me Dale, but I think in the best possible way, you look a little bit like um, Hopper from Stranger Things. He's like one of the coolest dudes, so I, I think that's really cool. Anyhow, so uh, Dale started Rolling Dale Cycles, Rolling Dale, get it, in 2016, and he's based in Alberta and Canada. Right now, I'm just gonna fire up a load of images that he sent me, so thank you for these images, because they are really cool, and I've got massive workshop envy of your place. Super cool setup. I'm just gonna read out what you actually wrote me, because it's really cool. It was, the hammer is straightforward. I've worked in bike shops since I could hang onto a wrench in my dad's garage. So a hammer is a no-brainer when it comes to how it should feel naturally in one's hand. Completely agree with that. I think I'm on a bit of a weird search to find like my favorite. I've got about six hammers at the moment for some reason. Uh, in this case, I set out to build a hammer for tapping on the work front versus like a mallet for clubbing stuff in. Although I'm certain it's tough enough for both. Today my shop is split between machine work, manual and CNC, TIG welding, as you can probably see some of the equipment here on screen, and assembling newly made custom bikes, of which yours, got to say, beautiful, beautiful welding in that, really, really nice. And hopefully there's some shots of you and your bike and some close-ups of the bike coming past. I decided to build the hammer just to satisfy a few local mechanics and to have a simple project to exercise my small weld, uh, my welding and CNC muscles. Our shop here is small, just myself and wife, and my brother from time to time. So wearing practical the hats means spending time staggered between tasks. The titanium hammer keeps my chops up. I'm not here to become the Thai hammer mogul of the Northern Hemisphere, and at 52, my ambition of those things has long faded. Well, I'll tell you what, Dale, you're certainly, you've got the right end of the stick. Like, what you're producing just looks lovely. I love the fact like you're really passionate about this stuff. You're very keenly, uh, you've been into bikes for a long time by the sounds of it, and what you're producing is beautiful. Uh, so big ups, and thank you so much for sending us the images. Um, as you know from the conversation we had on Instagram, it's just so nice to see people out there making stuff because they want to make this beautiful stuff. And that's for the hammer, like, it just looks off the charts, dude. Uh, super cool stuff. So I'm going to throw up Dale's Instagram on screen right there, Rolling Dale, Cy uh, Rolling Dale Cycles. Uh, please give him a follow and check out some of his rad posts because he's uh, making some lovely, lovely stuff. And that's what we need more of in the world of GMBN Tech and the tech community. <laughs> Okay, so in comments earlier on, we were talking about Bike Cave. So here it is, this is Bike Cave, the section of the show where we talk about your workshop, your garden shed, your cupboard under the stairs, your, under your bed, anywhere you keep your bike. Uh, wherever it is, it's cool with us. And it could be super basic and affordable, cheap stuff, or it could be a completely deluxe garden building. Anything goes. Uh, get involved, there's a link right there, it goes to our uploader. Uh, again, if you've got issues with the uploader, let us know. Uh, we can get it fixed. It's not gonna fix itself if we don't know there's a problem. So uh, yeah, help us out and we'll help you. Right, so first up, this is an awesome one. So this one's all the way from Cambodia. Now I've been to Cambodia, and I've got to say, I didn't really see much in the way of cycling or cyclists over there. Uh, I must have missed you, Nicholas, because you've got a wicked place. Uh, I love the styling of it as well. Um, right, so you've got Canyon Lux, and Canyon Rain, Canyon Slate, and a specialized Venge. My home in Cambodia. This is my bike cave, which is actually a part of our living room, uh, to the great joy of my wife. <laughs> you must have a very, very supportive wife to have all of that in your front room. Um, I know that I wasn't allowed, but then I lucked out by having to have this so I could shut the door in it all. Um, but it looks awesome. I love in the, uh, the road bike up on the wall. So what is that? Is that the Cannondale? I'm not even quite sure what one that is, but um, it looks awesome up there with that front wheel on it. Kind of reminds me of what people used to do uh, in the 90s when you know, you'd know you run maybe a disc wheel on the back and like a tri-spoke on the front and stuff. I kind of quite like that look. Looks good, dude. It looks really good. Loving the place as well. That stairwell is super cool. Reminds me of um, a few cool places I've been to over the years. Nice. Well, thanks for sending that one in. Right, next one is from Douglas in Vermont. Just finished putting together the bike shop and car shop. Working on all our bikes and my wife's 78 Corvette. Oh, nice. Currently finishing up a spring tune-up on my friend's bike. Oh, of course, you're helping your mates out as well. Liking the artwork on there, the Yeti banner at the back. Awesome, got a bit of a longboard going on down there as well. Dude, this great setup you've got in here. Awesome, look at that Corvette. Oh, that is 
dirty looking, I love it. You've got a very cool little setup there. Yeah, well, not so little. You've got a very cool setup there. Uh, really nice. Thank you, Douglas, for sending that in. Uh, there's your Yeti. I've got to say, I do love the orange. We did have one on the show, I can't remember how long ago now, when it, when it first came out in that colour, the SP150, and I loved it. I, I can't look past the fact it's orange, though. Like, it's a beautiful colour, but if it's Yeti, I've just got to have Yeti blue. Um, Maybe that's just me, but it is a lovely bike. Rides real good. Interesting to see you got, is that an 11.6 coil on there? Uh, man, I bet that thing is absolutely planted. Beautiful bike, that. Really, really nice. Okay, so this one's from Jack in Thursk, North Yorkshire. My family's very crammed bike cave with 11 bikes currently between four of us. Uh, currently, uh, today I got the Mega and the Descent to go out to our place in Morzine to live there. Wow, okay. Uh, no space for a worktop. Um, so I work out my toolbox, which is shown. Yes, this is the way. So what you got stuffed in here then? All right, so you've got some park tool goodies in there, some cable cutters, uh, posi drive, Allen keys, um, the picks at the top. Oh, you've got one of those Oppenel knives. I've got one of those actually. As to Hassan, I've got written on my one. Yeah, I picked one of these up when I was uh, out on a trip a while back. Quite, quite classic looking old pocket knife that. To be honest, it never gets used, but it's really nice and I like it. Uh, cool to see you've got one as well. What else you got in there? Oh, there we go. So, bottom layer hanging off there. Yes. Little parts trays on the inside. Ratchets. Love a good ratchet. Different greases. Shram butter. Nice stuff. Okay. Uh, next one is from Michael in, which he says at home. Hi, Doddy. I thought I'd share my IKEA hack bike cave. Right. This could be great for a lot of people. I don't have too much room in my garage as I still need to get a car in. I've used an IKEA folding table, table wall mounted. Great idea, so that's a kitchen breakfast bar type table. Genius. Uh, backed with chipboard and stuck up a couple of pictures. It then folds away and the bike wall, uh, the bike wall mounts and pivot out to the side. Yeah, that's an awesome use of space. Yeah, there's no, there's no such thing as not having enough room. You just gotta be creative in how you do stuff. So yeah, this is really cool. And dude, you've got plenty of room there with that pegboard. You've got like a roll holder there for your shop towel. You've got your gloves and your lubes and all that stuff on the back shelf and your tools on the pegboard. Brilliant. And a little mini worktop. That's, that's actually genius. That is a great idea. Hmm. So there's a bit of a theme here with sort of storage hacks and things. I think, I think we need to make this a video, don't we? Um, that's a wicked idea, Michael. I'm going to borrow that idea for the video if you don't mind. I think that's really cool. And so you've got some power in there as well. Nice bit of lighting. Got your work stand as well, portable so you can get it away. Um, got your Swinley post and ride bikes and be happy. I love the trail trail map stuff, it's really cool. Uh, yeah, nice, okay, awesome. Well, some really good good stuff there from Bike Cave this week. Um, get yours in and we'll get them on the show. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this week's show. Uh, loads of loads of stuff in there. Again, once more, sorry about the Float X, DPXT thing. Getting me X's messed up. Um, give us some comments and some feedback on the show and we'll see you next week. ta -ra.